What is the link between red meat and weight loss? And what is the link between red meat and our hormones? Look, I'm a guy that's not a huge proponent of eating large amounts of meat, but I also have to do a service to those that are watching this video and lay out the facts. So what I want to do here is I want to explain how red meat is linked with our testosterone, linked with our estrogen, but also how much red meat you can get away with consuming before it ever becomes dangerous or ever becomes a cancer-causing issue. So let's take a look at the science and let's do some deep dives into the hormones, into the frequency, and also into what you can do personally. Hey, if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button. That way you can get access to new videos every Tuesday, every Friday, and every Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time. And also, turn on that little bell icon. That's going to give you notifications so you know whenever I do live coaching broadcasts or anything like that. Let's go ahead and start off with the link between red meat and testosterone and estrogen. It does not matter if you are male or female. We still have to take a look at these two pivotal hormones because they play such a role when it comes down to our body composition, but also how we feel. The first thing we want to look at is the link with red meat and the mineral known as zinc. Okay, it's pretty common knowledge that red meat has zinc, and it's fairly common knowledge, at least on the internet, that zinc helps to unlock testosterone. But scientists and researchers don't really know why. You see, all they've really found is a correlation. When zinc levels are low, testosterone levels are low. But we can start to hypothesize that it has to do with the estrogen component, which I'll explain in just a minute. The other thing we have to look at with red meat is the high levels of what is called arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is, unfortunately, an omega-6. Now, omega-6s I'm not a big fan of, but in small amounts, they do play a big role. Arachidonic acid plays a very powerful role when it comes down to steroidogenesis, which is the creation of testosterone in the testes of men, and actually a little bit, in a small degree, in the ovaries of females. So it's very, very important. If we don't have this arachidonic acid that's in sort of the visceral fat that is in red meat, we don't produce enough testosterone. But additionally, when we start factoring that in with the zinc, it starts to make sense. You see, our zinc levels, when they are low, we don't produce as much testosterone. But a lot of the reasons it's hypothesized to do that is simply because low levels of zinc increase the amount of estrogen receptors in the body. When we have more estrogen receptors, we're more susceptible to high levels of estrogen. You see, the way it works is that if we have a large amount of testosterone in the body, and we have a large amount that we're not utilizing, that extra amount goes through what is called aromatization. That process means that that extra testosterone gets converted into estrogen. So if we have more estrogen receptors in our bodies, we have a higher likelihood of that extra testosterone getting converted into estrogen. Then it turns into a vicious circle, because once our levels of estrogen start creeping up, our levels of estrogen inversely go down. So we don't want this. So that increasingly gets worse and worse and worse. Higher levels of estrogen mean more water retention. It means more of that spare tire. It's the things that you don't really want. You want to have yourself be right in balance. There's also another component of red meat that we want to look at too, and that's iron. Now, if you've watched my videos before, you know that I'm not a big fan of taking in extra iron. I'm a firm believer that we get enough iron already. The problem isn't that we're not getting enough iron or that we're anemic. The problem is that we have bioavailable iron and non-bioavailable iron, iron that's actually literally bound up in our body, not being used. Now, when we look at this, we understand that there's non-heme iron and there's heme iron. Heme iron is coming from the red meat sources, the fish sources, things like that. Non-heme iron is coming from the plant sources. Well, it's been shown in studies that the non-heme iron does not absorb nearly as well. We're talking about a 2 to 20% bioavailability versus the heme iron coming in at more like a 7 to 37% bioavailability. Big, big difference. Now again, this isn't the key here, but it still plays a big role when it comes down to producing oxygen that's going to allow us to have more testosterone and feel better in the first place. So let's take a look at the first study of this video. This study took a look at eight male participants. Okay, they were divided into two groups. One group was a lacto-ovo vegetarian group, which means that they consumed milk products and they consumed eggs. But other than that, they were vegetarian. And then we have another group that was sort of a mixed group. They ate meat products. So what we wanted to look at was the overall levels of serum testosterone. Now, both of these groups, they had consumed the same macronutrient ratios, the same level of proteins, fats, and carbs. So there's no real change in the diet other than the fact that red meat was implemented into the group that was consuming the meat, of course. So when we look at the end result, it was pretty interesting. The lacto-ovo group ended up resulting in a lower testosterone level at 13.7 nanomoles per liter, whereas the group that had some meat ended up ending at 17.4 nanomoles per liter. Now here's where it gets kind of interesting. This was total serum testosterone. Okay, this isn't the free testosterone. So what's interesting is that the free testosterone didn't change, and the gonadotropins didn't change, the precursors to testosterone. We only saw an increase in total testosterone, which doesn't really mean a whole lot. 
So why would I include this study when it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense? Well, stick with me, because I'm going to connect the dots, and it's all going to add up. The point is, at least the meat group had a total increase in testosterone. So let's look at estrogen now for a second. The Journal of Public Health published a study that said that groups that were consuming a vegetarian-style diet had lower levels of E1 and E2, two different types of estrogen, than those that consumed meat. So why, again, am I including this study? Well, it just doesn't make sense. Why is Thomas saying total testosterone increases and estrogens lower in the vegetarian group? It sounds like I'm trying to promote a vegetarian lifestyle. No, I'm not, actually. What I'm trying to get to is the fact that it's the kinds of meats that we're consuming. You see, when we start looking at these studies, we realize that the meat sources are U.S. red meat sources. And the problem with the U.S. red meat sources is all the steroid implantations and all the estrogen that is being fed to them. So let's take a look at another study that acts as a tiebreaker and allows this to all make some serious sense. In a study that was published in the Annals of Oncology, it was found that U.S. beef compared to Japanese beef ended up having 11 times higher concentrations of E1 and 140 times higher concentrations of E2, estradiol, the active form of estrogen. 140x in U.S. beef versus Japanese beef, which is shown to be some of the highest quality beef. Now, that's not to say that you can't get true grass-fed, grass-finished beef in the States, but the point is that if you take a look at the big picture and you realize that red meat is going to increase total testosterone levels, and if you're doing it in a way that's also not gonna consequently increase your estrogen levels, you're putting yourself in a great situation. You're increasing testosterone, but you're potentially reducing estrogen levels, meaning that testosterone can go to work and not go through its aromatization process and turn into estrogen you're in a great situation where you can actually go into a positive cycle of creating more testosterone and keeping estrogen at bay. And this is where my friends at ButcherBox come in because they are one of the only sources of true grass-fed and grass-finished beef that you can find, and it's literally cheaper than going to the grocery store. I talk about them in my videos all the time, and you can check them out in the description down below and get access to true grass-fed, grass-finished beef, and literally, literally cheaper than the grocery store delivered right to your door. But I'm not ending the video here. ButcherBox is great, but I've got more to talk about. What about how often you should consume red meat? Okay, I'm gonna be honest with you here. I don't consume a whole lot of red meat. The meat that I do consume is usually pretty lean in the way of chicken and lean in the way of fish, and I'll consume red meat here and there. But the fact is, we need to understand how much red meat you can truly get away with. Because we understand, at least here in the States, that there's some people that just love their red meat. They just don't feel good without it. And they're probably dying to know, how much of this stuff can I consume before it's a problem? So let's take a look at some of this. Well, I'll put your mind at ease when I say that the studies really show that it's the mycotoxins and the steroid implantations that have the links to diseases. It's much less the red meat consumption, and it's more the processing. So when you're looking at processed meats, you're looking at the roast beefs, or you're looking at the low quality meats, the low quality beefs, those are the ones that end up causing the issues. So let's look at some science. There was a meta-analysis that took a look at 20 studies with over 1.2 million people involved. And what they wanted to look at was the link to coronary disease, to cardiac disease, and just any kind of terminal disease or things that were just unhealthy in general. So they took a look at processed meats and unprocessed meats. And they found that the processed meats had a direct link with heart disease, with diabetes, and some cancers. Okay, not really surprised there. But guess what? They found that the unprocessed red meat had no link to heart disease, no link to the cancers, and no link to the diabetes. Just general health markers. They found that really where things get messy is most of the studies that say red meat is bad are grouping in all the processed red meats too. Again, the roast beefs, the deli meats, the things like that. They're not looking at true good quality red meat. The other thing that we have to look at is how this red meat is cooked. Okay, none of us wanna be that dorky dad that's obsessed with grilling, okay? But the fact is, if you start becoming a little bit more of a grill master, you might reduce the risk of cancer, and it all has to do with heterocyclic amines. Believe it or not, how we cook the red meat makes a big difference. Remember those arachidonic acids I talked about at the beginning of the video? Well, if they react with high temperature, those omega-6s can cause something that's very carcinogenic, okay? They create what are called heterocyclic amines. These HCAs are what trigger cancer within your body. So we don't want that. You wanna cook your beef at a little bit lower temperature, a little bit of a slower rate, maybe put it in a smoker or cook it at a low temp. It makes a huge difference and then you're not having a charred steak anyway. But I want to end this video with one really awesome study. And this study I think just groups it all together because it screams moderation and it screams balance and it screams what most of us are after to be honest. So this study was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and it took a look at 41 participants. Okay, and what they did is they divided these participants into two groups that were consuming a Mediterranean style diet. 
One Mediterranean style group consumed about a half a pound of red meat per week, and the other group consumed about a pound of red meat per week. Both groups consumed a lot of plants, and they consumed a lot of healthy fats. They were consuming olive oil, they were eating coconut oil, they were doing all the right things and eating a high plant-based diet with the exception of adding some meat in a healthy way. Well, what was found is at the end of the study, both groups ended up having very healthy markers overall. Both groups were in amazing shape and in better shape than they started out the study in. But what was interesting is the group that consumed a little bit more red meat actually lost about a pound more on average. This is pretty cool. Now, again, we don't understand why, other than the fact that if we truly look at the hormonal values, it was probably an estrogen-related thing. You see, we're talking about Europe for the most part, where we're having good quality meats and we're having good quality things that we're looking at. So when we're looking at sort of that Mediterranean-style diet, reduction in inflammation, everything is healthy, right? You have this nice, balanced body. But you're looking at good quality meats, so you probably had that reduction in estrogen. Now, like I mentioned before, high levels of estrogen trigger water retention. So we probably lost that pound in water and in fat just by reducing the estrogen levels by having a little bit more red meat. Now, a pound of red meat per week doesn't sound like a whole lot, but if you're consuming four or six ounces, that's a few times per week that you can have red meat for dinner and you're not gonna have an issue. You don't have to be worried about cancer, you don't have to be worried about heart disease and clogging your arteries. That has more to do with the soy and more to do with the garbage that you're consuming. So as always, make sure you keep it locked in here on this channel and make sure that you check out Butcher Box so you can get your hands on some true grass-fed, grass-finished beef that's gonna help you feel your best and get to your goals faster. Make sure you leave a comment, let me know what video you wanna see next and I'll see you in the next one.